Spring Quarter, Examining Our Faith. Unit 3, Standing in the Faith. Our lesson today is entitled, Who Has Believed? And it's coming from Romans chapter 10, verses 1 through 17, from the, mes the Message by Version of the Bible. So then faith heareth, cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Believe me, friends, all I want for Israel is what's best for Israel. Salvation, nothing less. I want it with all my heart and pray to God for it all the time. I readily admit that the Jews are impressively energetic regarding God, but they are doing everything exactly backward. They don't seem to realize that this comprehensive setting things right, that is salvation is God's business and a most flourishing business it is. Right across the street, they set up their own salvation shops and noisily peddle their knockoffs. After all these years of refusing to really deal with God on his terms, insisting instead on making their own deals, they have nothing to show for it. The earlier re revelation was intended simply to get us ready for the Messiah who then puts everything right for those who trust him to do it. Moses wrote that anyone who insists on using the law code to live right before God soon discovers it's not so easy. Every detail of life regulated by fine print. But trusting God to shape the right living in us is a different story. No precarious climb up to heaven to recruit the Messiah. No dangerous descent into hell to rescue the Messiah. So what exactly was Moses saying? The word that saves is right here. As near as the tongue in your mouth, as close as the heart in your chest. It's the word of faith welcomes God to go to work and set things right for us. This is the core of our preaching, saying, say the welcoming word to God. Jesus is my master, embracing body and soul, God's work of doing in us what he did in raising Jesus from the dead. That's it. You're not doing anything you're simply calling out to God, trusting him to do it for you. That's salvation. With your whole being, you embrace God, setting things right. And then you say it right out loud. God has set everything right between him and me. Scripture reassures us, no one who trusts God like this, heart and soul will ever regret it. It's exactly the same no matter what a person's religious background may be. The same God for all of us, acting the same incredibly generous way to everyone who calls out for help. Everyone who calls help God gets help. But how can people call for help if they don't know who to trust? And how can they know who to trust if they haven't heard of the one who can be trusted? And how can they hear if nobody tells them? And how is anyone going to tell them unless someone is sent to do it? That's why scripture exclaims, a sight to take your breath away, grand possessions of people, telling all the good things of God. 
But not everybody is ready for this. Ready to see and hear and act. Isaiah asked what we all ask at one time or another. Does anyone care, God? Is anyone listening and believing a word of it? The point is, before you trust, you have to listen. But unless Christ's word is preached, there is nothing to listen to. Did you know that returning to his earlier argument that you find in Romans chapter 2 and 3, Paul reiterates that the Jews had fallen into the trap of believing their own obedience to the Mosaic law resolved their sins and brought them peace with God. You'll find that in verses 1 through 10 of chapter 1 through 4 of chapter 10, that following the law brings righteousness, for the law is God's standard. But our actions are not up to God's standard and cannot address the sins committed against God that you find in verse 5 and verse 10, I mean, verse 3 of chapter 10, and thus cannot lead to restoration to God, meaning salvation. That Paul's quotation of Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 14, and in our lesson, chapter 10, verses 6 to 8, is meant to remind believers that Christ has already completed his ministry of our reconciliation with the Father from incarnation to resurrection. And all that is left to do is trust him for a process that he has already completed. Paul summarizes his arguments from Romans chapters 1 through 5, especially chapter 3 verses 1 and 2, by eradicating the boundary between Jew and Gentile that you find in verses 12 and 13 of chapter 10 placing all on equal footing of faith before God, making distinctions of dress, language, diet, or calendar completely irrelevant for salvation then as now. That receiving the incredible gift of salvation should not make us insular, but rather even more aware of the rest of the world's suffering without Jesus. Sincere faith has not only confession as its natural action, but also sharing the limitless, boundaryless gift with everyone. You'll find that in verses 14 through 17 of chapter 10. Our biblical, historical, geographical, and cultural background. Paul's letter to the Romans provides a concise summary of the gospel to the community of believers worshiping in Rome. In writing to a church that he had not yet visited, Paul aimed to uplift and guide his fellow Christians. Much of the letter is a succinct and straightforward explanation of the faith. It is a reminder from Paul based partly on his time in Corinth for us to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. The Lord had been crucified, buried, and resurrected from the grave, and then ascended into heaven. He was no longer here in the flesh, so all who come to him from now on initially do so based on what they hear about him. What a step of faith. It is the first step, but every journey in life begins with a first step. Paul wrote this letter to the church in Rome. Rome at that time was the most cosmopolitan, culturally diverse city in the whole Roman Empire. People came there from all over the empire. Some were traders and merchants passing through or just there for a specific time before returning to their homes, but they would come back again. 
others came and settled in as residents of the, of the city. All came with their own customs, cultures, beliefs, and practices. It is in that cultural and religious mixture that the Christians found themselves. It can be both exciting and frightening. For those who are strong in their faith, they would enjoy engaging in dialogue with persons of other religions or who have no religious faith at all. What an opportunity for evangelizing. For those not so strong, it would be overwhelming and scary. Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. You find that in verse 1 of chapter 10 of Romans. One, not, one might be able to read a sense of tiredness or pain in the voice of Paul as he penned this letter. He had been working so hard to get the gospel to the Gentiles and simultaneously to his own people. Have you ever experienced the frustration and pain that come from trying to get a loved one to Christ? No matter how hard you try, the person will not respond or always has an excuse for procrastinating in his or her decision making. To his credit, the apostle did not give up and neither should we. For centuries, the Jews had looked to the law and exhibited obedience to it as, a, as the source of obtaining a righteous standing before God. But things had changed drastically over the past 700 years since the Babylonian captivity. They experienced the dissolution of what they knew as a church-state way of life, they had seen the repeal of their ceremonial law and the loss of all the institutions attendant to it, including the priesthood, the temple, the center of their worship and faith had been burned. By the time of the writing of this letter, which was in AD 57, there was a nascent Catholic universal church state arising among Gentile nations, competing in some cases with the traditional Jewish faith. It seemed as though the Jews had lost favor with God. Paul addressed these changes, trying to explain them, but in doing so had to share two disrupting truths with his Jewish audience. First, he explains that there is a significant difference between the righteousness of faith and that under the law to which unbelieving non-Christian Jews held firmly. The second truth was that there was no difference between Gentiles and Jews in God's sight regarding sin. Relative to justification, the gospel sees them on the same level. A lesson explained. It is great and commendable to enter a task with enthusiasm, vigor, and excitement. It is said, however, if that energy is wasted due to ignorance, moving in the wrong direction, and or backing the wrong cause. It's not what you know in this text as much as it is who you know. It is not the law, but Jesus that you want to follow in your search for salvation. Paul speaks from a powerful and unique position. The persecutor turned preacher, the enemy turned emissary, opponent turned apologist. In his pre-salvation days, he described himself as a Hebrew of Hebrews. He studied under Gamaliel, the most renowned Jewish scholar of his day. 
No one was any stronger in the Jewish faith than Paul, and for him the law was the way to salvation until he met Jesus. The challenge he faced and had taken upon himself in response to the call of Jesus on his life was to take the gospel to the Gentiles, but he also sought to enlighten his fellow Jews about their misguided efforts to achieve salvation. It took a miracle on the Damascus Road to bring Paul to Christ. The question is, what would it take to enlighten his fellow Jews? Paul cited Moses on righteousness as it relates to the law. He then countered that with a statement on the righteousness that comes by faith. The latter is Paul's position, the one he was desperately trying to get his Jewish brothers and sisters to see and to which to conform. The Message Bible presents verse 8 in this way. The word that saves is right here, as near as the tongue in your mouth, as close as the heart in your chest. By faith, we welcome God to begin the work in us that leads to righteousness. Say what you want, but believe what you must. The two go together, public confession and private personal inner belief. One without the other does not work. Confession with the mouth points to a public mission of faith in Jesus, which is part of our commitment to him. Jesus says, For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed, when he shall come in his own glory and in his Father's and of the holy angels. You find that in Luke chapter 9, verse 26. If we deny Jesus here, then he will deny us there. The other part of this relationship involves our hearts. Saying that Jesus is Lord is one thing. Believing it is another. Some persons have no qualms about publicly claiming to be Christians, but an observation of their lives or lifestyles tells a different story. Actions do speak louder than words. Confession and heart belief go hand in hand like faith and works. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The Jew cannot fall back on the Abrahamic covenant or chosen status that Jews enjoy as a pass for not having to accept Jesus as the only way to salvation and righteousness. The equality that is found in Christianity includes the matter of sinfulness before God. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God and all need Christ to mediate their salvation. Note the progression in this section. The preaching of the gospel today is needed now more than ever. The pro pro proclaiming of the word in its uncompromised, unaltered, unadulterated state and presented unapologetically. There may be a tendency on the part of some believers to be hesitant in their witnessing when engaged in a pluralistic religious dialogue setting. There can be a fear of not wanting to offend anyone. We must remember that God, that gospel is foolishness and even offensive to some. Not everyone wants to hear it. This does not mean that we must be rude in conversation with those who do not believe as we do. There are good ways to approach dialogue with others. Take a lesson from Paul's approach as recorded in Acts chapter 17 verses 22 and 23. 
Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship. And this is what I am going to proclaim to you. Note that Paul tries to establish a positive relationship by identifying some areas he shares with his audience. People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. Once he has established a positive rapport based on a mutuality of interest, in this case, religious faith, he proceeds to examine his Jesus' message and his audience is inclined to at least hear him out. Just as persons in the Old Testament refused to hear and heed the words, warnings of the prophets, so some today will refuse to accept the good news of the gospel that salvation is experienced through faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. You find that in John chapter 20, verse 29. We believers say to the law, we have heard and believed. Blessed will you be when you likewise hear and believe. Some concluding thoughts and reflections. People want to follow prescribed steps that allow them to climb a guaranteed ladder to success. How do we react when others are offered a path to success that seemingly bypasses the rules we've carefully followed. In his letter to the Romans, Paul wrestles with this insufficiency of the zeal for God that comes through the law versus the new path to God that comes through faith in Christ. Some students have said of the scriptures that the defense of Stephen's in Acts chapter six and seven is not a defense at all. It is instead a witnessing. Sometimes the best defense or arg argument for the gospel that one can give is his or her personal testimony. After all, our text reads, faith comes from hearing. Hearing a strong testimony of what God has done in one's life through faith in Christ in Jesus Christ can be the best expression of the word. Jesus, the living word, to be made. We must not be afraid to tell our story. Confess, believe, be saved. Let us pray. O oh God, who makes promises and keeps them over generations and long centuries, our prayer is for all people near and far to come to know Jesus. Lord God, we pray that you will help us achieve the boldness to witness and testify that was demonstrated by the disciples, that we too may speak and witness with confidence about our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Send us. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Confess and believe that Jesus is Lord.